Section One of A Second Rubaiyat Miscellany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. Section One. Omar Khayyam or Khayyun, from Fraser's Magazine, Volume Twenty One. April 1840. Specimens of Persian Poetry. By Louisa Costello. One of the most remarkable of Persian poets, unprecedented in regard to the freedom of his religious opinions. The Voltaire of Persia, whose works gave great offence to the priests, but are, nevertheless, highly esteemed by general readers, apparently with justice, as the animation and brilliancy of his style are unquestionable his hatred of hypocrisy and the tricks of false devotees appears his crime in the eyes of the supposed pious his tolerance of other creeds was looked upon with equal suspicion and dislike he was born at nishapur and devoted much of his time to the study of astronomy of which science he was a distinguished professor but it is said that instead of his studies leading him to the acknowledgment of the supreme being they prompted his disbelief. The result of his reflections on this important subject is given in a poem of his, much celebrated under the title of Rubaiyat Omar Khayyam. He was the friend of Hassan Sabah, the founder of the sect of the Assassins, and it has been conjectured, assisted him in the establishment of his diabolical doctrine and fellowship. Some allowance must, however, be made for the prejudices of his historians, who would, of course, neglect nothing calculated to cast odium on one so inimical to their superstitions. Omar Khayyam seems particularly to direct his satire against the mysticism of Mawasi, the most exalted poet of his time, though inferior in his extraordinary and incomprehensible style to the later followers of the same school, Attar and the great Mullah. However reprehensible his mockery would be, if really directed against religion in general, it scarcely deserves the severity it met with when we consider that it was the abuses he attacked and the absurdities he ridiculed, and, as for the incongruities introduced into his poems, and his professed love of pleasure, he is only following, or rather pointing out as absurd, the contradictions of the mystic poets which are difficult enough to reconcile to the understanding, whether allegorical or not. The following will give an idea of the style of Omar Khayyam. Ye who seek for pious fame, and that light should gild your name, be this duty ne'er forgot, love your neighbour, harm him not. To thee, great spirit, I appeal, who canst the gates of truth unseal. I follow none, nor ask the way of men who go, like me, astray. They perish, but thou canst not die, but livest to all eternity. Such is vain man's uncertain state. A little makes him base or great. One hand shall hold the Koran's scroll, the other raise the sparkling bowl. One saves, and one condemns the soul. The temple I frequent is high, a Turkish vaulted dome, the sky that spans the worlds with majesty. Not quite a Moslem in my creed, not quite a Giaour, my faith indeed may startle some who hear me say, I give my pilgrim staff away, and sell my turban for an hour of music in a fair one's bower. I'd sell the rosary for wine, though holy names around it twine, and prayers the pious make so long, are turned by me to tender song. Or if a prayer I should repeat, it is at my beloved's feet. They blame me that my words are clear. I am, at least, what I appear. Nor do my acts my words belie. At least, I shun hypocrisy. It happened that but yesterday I marked a potter beating clay. The earth spoke out, Why dost thou strike? Both thou and I are born alike. Though some may sink and some may soar, we all are earth and nothing more. His verses in praise of beauty and wine 
are much admired guzzle nature made me love the rose and my hand was formed alone thus the wine cup to enclose blame then ye the goblet's foes nature's fault and not my own when a hoary form appears who a vase of ruby bears call me giaour if then i prize all the joys of paradise in praise of wine morn's first rays are glimmering from the skies the stars are creeping rouse for shame the goblet bring all too long thou liest sleeping open those narcissus eyes wake be happy and be wise why ungrateful man repine when the cup is bright with wine all my life i've sought in vain knowledge and content to gain all that nature could unfold have i in her page unrolled all of glorious and of grand i have sought to understand twas in youth my early thought riper years no wisdom brought life is ebbing sure though slow and i feel i nothing know bring the bowl at least in this dwells no shadowed distant bliss see i clasp the cup whose power yields more wisdom in an hour than whole years of study give vainly seeking how to live wine disperses into air selfish thoughts and selfish care dost thou know why wine i prize he who drinks all ill defies and can a while throw off the thrall of self the god we worship all the vanity of regret nothing in this world of ours flows as we would have it flow what avail then careful hours thought and trouble tears and woe through the shrouded veil of earth life's rich colours gleaming bright though in truth of little worth yet allure with meteor light life is torture or suspense thought is sorrow drive it hence with no will of mine i came with no will depart the same the praises of wine knowst thou whence the hues are drawn which the tulip's leaves adorn tis that blood has soaked the earth where her beauties had their birth knowst thou why the violet's eyes gleam with dewy purple dyes tis that tears for love untrue bathe the banks where first she grew if no roses bloom for me thorns my only flowers must be if no sun shine on my way torches must provide my day let me drink as drink the wise pardon for our weakness lies in the cup for heaven well knew when i first to being sprung i should love the rosy dew and its praise would oft be sung twere impiety to say we would cast the cup away and be votaries no more since twas all ordained before the latter part of this poem seems written in ridicule of the belief in predestination carried to so absurd a length by mohammedans Reland cites these lines on the subject that which is written must arrive tis vain to murmur or to strive give up all thought to god for he has fixed thy doom by his decree all good all ill depends on fate the slaves of god must bear and wait not only as respects man does this superstition apply but it extends to everything in nature sadi relates in his gulistan of a fisherman who had caught a fish which his strength did not allow him to drag to shore fearing to be drawn into the river himself he abandoned his line and the fish swam away with the bait in his mouth his companions mocked him and he replied what could i do this animal escaped because his last hour fixed by fate was not yet come fate governs all and a fisherman cannot overcome it more than another nor can he catch fish if fate is against him even in the tigris the fish itself even though dry would not die if it was the will of fate to preserve its life the poet adds o man why shouldst thou fear if thy hour is not come 
In vain would thy enemy rush against thee with his lance in rest. His arms and his feet would be tied by fate, and the arrow would be turned away, though in the hands of the most expert archer. A father thus speaks to his son. Honours and riches are not the fruits of our efforts. Therefore give thyself no useless trouble. They cannot be obtained by force, and all efforts to obtain are of no more service than collyrium on the eyes of the blind. Thou mayst be a prodigy of talent, but all thy genius is of no avail, if fate is against thee. Reproach me not, and vainly say, why idly thus, from day to day, let every good pass by thy door, nor swell by industry thy store. I answer, labour, toil, and pain, prudence, wit, foresight, all is vain, travels are useless, some succeed, but others but to failure lead, fate rules, the miser counts his heaps, and fortune crowns him while he sleeps. The Wisdom of the Supreme All we see, above, around, is but built on fairy ground. All we trust is empty shade, to deceive our reason made. Tell me not of paradise, or the beams of Huri's eyes, who the truth of tales can tell, cunning priests invent so well. He who leaves this mortal shore, quits it to return no more. In vast life's unbounded tide, they alone content may gain, who can good from ill divide, or in ignorance abide. All between is restless pain. Before thy prescience, power divine, what is this idle sense of mine? What all the learning of the schools? What sages, priests, and pedants? Fools, the world is thine. From thee it rose, by thee it ebbs by thee it flows hence worldly law by whom is wisdom shown the eternal knows knows all and he alone end of section section two of a second ruby at miscellany this librivox recording is in the public domain omar khayyam the Astronomer Poet of Persia by E. B. Cowell in Calcutta Review number fifty nine, march eighteen fifty eight, pages one hundred and forty nine to one hundred and sixty two. We have all read in our childhood, in some form or other, the story of the Crusades, and few names are more indelibly impressed on the memory than the Old Man of the Mountains, that mysterious potentate round whose inaccessible retreat there hung such a cloud of fable, which sober history, even in these later days, has not been wholly able to dissipate. History tries to make her lamp throw a steady gleam upon that domain of romance, and dispels some of the illusions which the ignorant awe of the Crusaders had conjured up. Thus his very name has been reduced to the well-known Sheikh, a symbol of patriarchal authority, not of years. But the imagination, after all, cannot give up the vision of the grey-haired sorcerer with his impregnable castle and gardens of delight, where the young devotee was introduced intoxicated and awoke to find himself in a fancied paradise whose image should remain in his heart for ever, to nerve his arm for any enterprise which his chief might enjoin. These things may fade in the daylight of history, but to the imagination they must still hold their place, and the old man of the mountains will still stand in the background of the Crusades, the same fierce and mysterious figure to the young student of every time, which he was to the Crusaders who first heard of his name, or to the monks at home who wrote from their lips when they returned histories of God's dealings by the Franks in his own land. It is with this old man that we have now to do, and yet how wide seems the interval between this man of blood in his mountain home and a poet of Persia. It is indeed a strange piece of forgotten history which thus joins two such different characters and leads us to the spot where the two streams still flowed side by side which were fated hereafter to diverge so far. In the middle of the 11th century, 
some twenty-five years before the Norman won the broad lands of the Saxon, a great revolution took place in the east. The iconoclast Mahmud of Ghazni had left his kingdom in a successor's feebler grasp, and the fierce Tartar tribes, which roamed beyond the Oxus, in that officina gentium of the east, had risen against his authority, and had driven him, an exile, southwards beyond the Hindu Kush. The sceptre of Persia thus passed to the invading chief, who, under the name of Togrul Beg, established the Seljukian dynasty, a memorable name amid the shadows which chased one another so rapidly across the scene of Oriental history. It was the Seljukides who caused the Crusades. The caliphs of Baghdad and Egypt, and their provincial vice-regents, had found it to their interest to protect the pilgrims of the West as they flocked to the holy city, and they had held undisputed possession of Palestine. The frank stranger might mourn that Omar's mosque stood on Mount Moriah, but he thankfully paid his pilgrim tax and returned in peace to his home. But the Turkish conquerors knew nothing of the advantages of interchange and commerce. Their only law was the sword. From the hour of their rise, the pilgrims were crushed by their oppression and returned to their several lands with dismal tales of Turkish license and cruelty. They did not complain in vain. A nerve was touched of exquisite feeling, and the sensation vibrated to the heart of Europe. But the Crusades were still future at the time when our narrative opens. Alp Arslan, or Alp the Lion, was on the throne of his father Togrul Beg, in every respect the Coeur de Lyon of Eastern story, when three youths were studying together under the great doctor of Islam, Moafak of Neshapur. One of them has left his own account, so that we will tell it in his own words. One of the greatest of the wise men of Khorasan was the Imam Moafak of Neshapur, a man highly honoured and reverenced. May God rejoice his soul. His illustrious years exceeded eighty-five, and it was the universal belief that every boy who read the Koran, or studied the traditions in his presence, would assuredly attain to honour and happiness. For this cause did my father send me from Tus to Neshapur with Abdu Samad, the doctor of law, that I might employ myself in study and learning under the guidance of that illustrious teacher. Towards me he ever turned an eye of favour and kindness, and, as his pupil, I felt for him extreme affection and devotion, so that I passed four years in his service. When I first came there, I found two other pupils of mine own age newly arrived, Hakim Omar Khayyam and the ill-fated Ben Sabah. Both were endowed with sharpness of wit and the highest natural powers, and we three formed a close friendship together. When the Imam rose from his lectures, they used to join me, and we repeated to each other the lessons we had heard. Now, Omar was a native of Neshapur, while Hassan ben Sabah's father was one Ali, a man of austere life and practice, but heretical in his creed and doctrine. He had long sojourned in the province of Bray, where Abu Moslim Razi was governor, a man of pure life and orthodox principles, who, like a good Mussulman as he was, showed deep enmity to such an heretic. But Ali still kept close at his side, and, by lying oaths and protestations, sought to clear himself from the insane words and actions laid to his charge. Now, the Imam Moafak was followed, as an example, by all orthodox Mussulmans. So this unhappy man, to remove all suspicion of his heresies, brought his son to Neshapur, and made him attend the lectures of the Imam. He himself chose a life of asceticism in a cloister. But even while there, men rumoured speeches of heresy that he had uttered, sometimes of one kind, and sometimes of another. But to my story, one day Hassan said to me, and to Kayam, It is a universal belief that the pupils of the Imam Moafak will attain to fortune. Now, even if we all do not attain thereto, without doubt one of us will, what then shall be our mutual pledge and bond? We answered, Be it what you please. Well, he said, let us make a vow that to whomsoever this fortune falls, he shall share it equally with the rest, and reserve no preeminence for himself. 
be it so we both replied and on these terms we mutually pledged our words years rolled on and i went from khorasan to transoxiana and wandered to ghazni and kabul and when i returned i was invested with office and rose to be administrator of affairs during the sultanate of sultan alp ashlan such is the narrative of nizam ul mulk the famous vizier of alp ashlan and of his son and successor malik shah who gives this story of his youth in his political will wasia nizam ul mulk that is testamentum politicum which he wrote in his old age as a manual to future statesmen he goes on to state that years passed by and both his old school friends found him out and came and claimed a share in his good fortune according to the school day vow the vizier was generous and kept his word hassan demanded a place in the government which the sultan granted at the vizier's request but discontented with the gradual rise he plunged into the maze of intrigue of an oriental court and failing in a base attempt to supplant his benefactor he was disgraced and fell his subsequent adventures are one of the romances of oriental history after many mishaps and wanderings he became the head of the persian sect of the ismalians a party of fanatics who had long murmured in obscurity but rose to an evil eminence under the guidance of his strong and evil will in a d ten ninety he seized the castle of alamut in the province of rudbar which lies in the mountainous tract south of the caspian sea here he fixed his stronghold and it was from this mountain home that the sheikh obtained that evil celebrity among the crusaders as the old man of the mountains from alamut issued those fierce fanatics who in blind devotion to their chief's commands spread terror through the mohammedan world and it is yet disputed whether the word assassin which they have left in the language of modern europe as their dark memorial is derived from the hashish or opiate of hemp leaves the indian bung with which they maddened themselves to the sullen pitch of oriental desperation or from the name of the founder of the dynasty whom we have seen in his quiet collegiate days at naishapur to complete the picture we need only add that one of the countless victims of the assassin's dagger was nizam ul mulk himself the old schoolboy friend omar khayyam also came to the vizier to claim his share but not to ask for title or office the greatest boon you can confer on me he said is to let me live in a corner under the shadow of your fortune to spread wide the advantages of science and pray for your long life and prosperity the vizier tells us that when he found that he was really sincere in his refusal he pressed him no further but granted him a yearly pension of twelve hundred mithkils of gold from the treasury of naishapur at naishapur thus lived and died omar khayyam the poet astronomer of persia busied adds the vizier in winning knowledge of every kind and especially in astronomy wherein he attained to a very high preeminence under the sultanate of malik shah he came to merv and obtained great praise for his proficiency in science and the sultan showered favours upon him of omar's attainments as an astronomer we have ample proof when malik shah determined to reform the calendar he was one of the eight learned men employed to do it and the result was the jalali era so called from the jalal ul din one of the king's names a computation of time says gibbon which surpasses the julian and approaches the accuracy of the gregorian style he is also the author of some astronomical tables entitled zidji malik shai and we have placed at the head of our article a treatise of his on algebra which has been lately translated and published in europe of the particular incidents of his life we know little enough but probably there was little to know a life like his spent in quiet toil and hiving knowledge with each studious year leaves little for the chronicler to record his takalis or poetical name khayyam signifies a tent maker and he is said to have at one time exercised that trade perhaps before nizam ul mulk's generosity raised him to independence many persian poets similarly derive their names from their occupations thus we have attar a druggist asar an oil presser etc 
Omar himself alludes to his name in the following whimsical lines. Kayam, who stitched the tents of science, has fallen in grief's furnace and been suddenly burned. The shears of fate have cut the tent ropes of his life, and the broker of hope has sold him for nothing. We have only one more anecdote to give, and that relates to the close, and then we shall turn from Omar, the mathematician, to the more interesting character, Omar the poet. The following incident is given in the anonymous preface which is sometimes prefixed to his poems. It has been printed in the Persian in the appendix to Hyde's Veterum Persarum Religio, page 499, and Derbalot alludes to it in his Bibliothèque under Qiyam. It is written in the Chronicles of the Ancients that this king of the wise, Omar Qiyam, died at Neshapur in the year of the Hegira 517, A.D. 1123. In science he was unrivalled, the very paragon of his age. Kawaj Nizami of Samarkand, who was one of his pupils, relates the following story. I often used to hold conversations with my teacher, Omar Khayyam, in a garden, and one day he said to me, My tomb shall be in a spot where the north wind may scatter roses over it. I wondered at the words he spake, but I knew that his were no idle words. Years after, when I chanced to revisit Naishapur, I went to his final resting place, and lo, it was just outside a garden, and trees laden with fruit stretched their boughs over the garden wall, and dropped their flowers upon his tomb, so that the stone was hidden under them. A grave fit for the poet, and to his poems we now turn. Omar Khayyam's poems are unique in the literary history of the world. It is not often that a great mathematician indulges in a relaxation of verse. One remembers Sir Isaac Newton's scorn of spoilt prose, and is apt to think of Urania as somewhat shy of familiar intercourse with her sisters. But in Omar we have not only an example of the perfect compatibility of the severest studies in the exact sciences, with that play of fancy and delicacy of feeling which we associate with the poet, this is by no means all the marvel. We find, in his verses, a totally different character to that which we should have naturally expected from the prevailing habit of thought in which he lived. Our double-natured poet is a Janus, whose two heads bear no similarity. The one half of his life in experience contradicts the other. Was it that the melancholy temperament, which Aristotle of old attributed to all poets and mathematicians, being thus doubled in intensity, by this twofold liability, found its full utterance in these bitter tetristics, turning for a while from its exact and abstract studies with all their unreal truth, distant but distant, clear but oh, how cold, only to find in life and time enigmas still more puzzling and problems still more indeterminate, and uttering in these lines its sullen protest of weariness? From the centre of earth to the zenith of Saturn, I solved all the problems of the heavens. I leapt forth from the bonds of every snare and deceit, and every bond was unloosed, except the bond of death. Every other poet of Persia has written too much. Even her noblest sons of genius weary with their prolixity. The language has a fatal facility of rhyme, which makes it easier to write in verse than in prose and every author heaps volumes on volumes until he buries himself and his reader beneath their weight. Our mathematician is the one solitary exception. He has left fewer lines than grey. This little volume of tetristics, be their real number what they may, occupies its own niche in Persian literature. Footnote. The only two manuscripts which we have seen are number 140 in the Oosley collection in the Bodleian Library, a very beautiful manuscript, written at Shiraz, Anohegira, 865, A.D. 1460. This contains only 158 tetristics, and number 1548 in the Asiatic Society, Calcutta, which probably wants a leaf or two at the end, and is negligently transcribed. This contains 516. Von Hammer, in his Geschichte, Der schönen Redekünste Persiens, speaks of his own manuscript as containing about 200. 
The Lucknow manuscript, mentioned in Dr. Sprenger's catalogue, contains 408. Since this paper was written, we have met with a copy of a very rare edition, printed at Calcutta, A.H. 1252, A.D. 1836. This contains 438 tetrasticks, with an appendix containing 54 others, not found in some manuscripts, 492 in all. End footnote. For terseness of expression and vigour of thought, we know of no epigrams like them, even in the Greek anthology. While for passionate earnestness and concentrated sadness, there is nothing equal to them except Lucretius. The Epicurean views which pervade them, but add a deeper gloom to the melancholy, we know that the gaiety is unreal, and the poet's smile is but a risus sardonicus of despair. All things whisper in his ear of change and decay. The sad refrain rings ever in his hearing. Everywhere in the world he reads the record of the inscription which Solomon, in Eastern story, gave for a signet ring, when one asked him for a motto, which should suit alike prosperity and adversity. This also shall pass away. Since life is all passing, what matter Baghdad or bulk? If our cup be full, what matter bitter or sweet? Drink wine, for long after thee and me, yon moon will still fill to its full, and still waste to its wane. Or this, yon rolling heaven for our destruction, yours and mine, aims its stroke at our lives, yours and mine. Come, love, sit on the grass, it will not be long ere grass grows out of our dust, yours and mine. This law, if one might call it so, of corporeal transmigration occurs again and again in his poems. It seems to jar on the poet's inmost soul and give him a peculiar pang. Elsewhere he has it in a more general shape. Wheresoever is rose or tulip bed, its redness comes from the blood of kings. Every violet stalk that springs from the earth was once a mole on a loved one's cheek. In this form, the thought is not peculiar to the East. We find a very similar passage in one of Shelley's poems. There's not one atom of yon earth but once was living man, nor the minutest drop of rain that hangeth in its thinnest cloud, but flowed in human vein. We will add one more of this class of tetrasticks before we pass on to others. In this, there is a peculiar delicacy of touch, which softens the roughness of the original thought. This flask was once a poor lover like me, all immersed in the chase of a fair face, and this, its handle, you see on its neck, was once a hand that clasped a beloved. The extracts, which we have already quoted, will give our readers an idea of Omar's poetry, and perhaps they will, ere this, have recognised one of its peculiar features. Omar lived in an age of poetical mysticism, but he himself is no mystic. His exact sciences kept him from the vague dreams of his contemporaries. He never loses himself in the one and the all. He plants his foot on the terra firma of today and builds on it as if it were rock and not a quicksand. Sweet blows on the rose's face the breeze of the new spring. Sweet down in the garden are the faces of the heart in flamers. But naught is sweet that thou canst tell of a yesterday past. Come, be glad, nor talk of yesterday. Today is so sweet. But Omar, for all his insight, had not made the wiser choice. The mysticism, in which the better spirits of Persia loved to lose themselves, was a higher thing, after all, than his keen worldliness, because this was but of the earth, and bounded by the earth's narrow span, while that, albeit an error, was a groping after the divine. There was a depth in that vague mysticism which Omar's science had never sounded. It sprang from wants and feelings to which his own heart was a stranger. And hence, though his poetry was real and full of passion, it moved cabined, cribbed, confined, in the animal life of the senses, and seems dazzled at any prospect beyond the grave. His very ideas of death seem confined to the body. He can feel, like Keats, 
the flowers growing over him, but he rarely looks or thinks beyond. And yet it is not always so. A few rare tetrasticks testify that Omar could not always prove a traitor to his own genius, that sometimes it overmastered his habits and wrung unwonted aspirations perforce from his lips. O heart, wert thou pure from the body's dust, thou shouldst soar naked spirit above the sky. Highest heaven is thy native seat. For shame, for shame that thou shouldst stoop to dwell in the city of clay. No wonder that gloom overshadows all Omar Khayyam's poetry. He was false to his better self, and therefore ill at ease and sad. He was resolved to ignore the future and the spiritual, and anchor only by the material and tangible. But his very insight became blinded and misled him, and instead of something solid and satisfying, he grasped only a darkness that could be felt. We can trace the evil running like a canker through his life, his pleasures, his friendships, nay, his very studies became blighted under its touch. Bernoulli could find such an intense delight in his problems that he could say that they gave him some idea of the happiness of heaven. His faculties were working unrestrained towards their proper object, and pleasure, old philosophers tell us, supervenes on such harmonious action as a finish or bloom. But in Omar there was no such internal harmony. The diviner part within him was ignored, and hence the very studies in which his life was spent failed to yield him solid enjoyment. Had he been only a thoughtless Epicurean, we should have looked at his poetry in a very different light. The careless gaiety of Horace never loses its charm, for it was the spontaneous outburst of his nature. He floated on life's surface, with no deep passion for anything, and his poetry bears the true impress of his character. But in Omar there was a resolute will. He was deeply earnest in science, and to dally with doubt and Epicureanism was possible only when he was not in earnest. It was this which caused the mortal jar in his character, and hence his poetry reads to us like sweet bells jangled, out of tune and harsh. We have said that Omar was no mystic. We find no trace of Sufism in his book. His roses bloom in an earthly summer. His wine is of mortal vintage. Unlike all other Persian poets, everything with him is real and concrete. That tone of revelry which in Hafez and Jami was but a passing fashion under which their genius veiled its higher aspirations, like the Petrarchan sonnet in the hands of Shakespeare or Milton, is, in Omar Khayyam, the matter itself, not the form. He turns in these quatrains from his science and astronomy to drown thought in the passing moment's pleasures. He seems to forget his better self in his temporary Epicurean disguise. My coming was not of mine own design, and one day I must go, and no choice of mine. Come, light-handed cupbearer, gird thee to serve. We must wash down the care of this world with wine. Come, bring me that ruby in yon crystal cup, that true friend and brother of every open heart. Thou knowest too well that this life on earth is a wind that hurries by. Bring the wine. Since none can promise himself to-morrow, make that forlorn heart of thine glad to-day. Drink wine, fair moon-faced, by the light of yon moon, for oft shall it look for us, and find us not. What, though the wine rends my veil? While I live, I will never tear me away. I marvel much at the sellers of wine, for what better thing can they buy than what they sell? The caravan of life hurries strangely by, sees every moment that passes in joy. Why, cupbearer, mourn for the morrow of thy friends? Give the cup of wine, for the night hurries by. A few of the tetristics breathe the same spirit of contentment which we should have expected from their author's old reply to the vizier's invitations to power. Some ruby wine and a divan of poems a crust of bread to keep the breath in one's body, and thou and I, alone in a desert, 
were a lot beyond a sultan's throne. Of all the world my choice is two crusts and a corner. I have severed my desires from power and its pomp. I have bought me poverty with heart and soul, for I have found the true riches in poverty. O oh, my heart, since life's reality is illusion, why vex thyself with its sorrows and cares? Commit thee to fate, contented with the hour, for the pen, once passed, returns not back for thee. But in too many of his poems we find a settled gloom, which stands in striking contrast to the assumed carelessness. Omar is ill at ease within, and his internal discord reflects itself in an angry defiance of the world and its opinions and beliefs. Like the Roman Lucretius, his very science leads him astray. He has learned enough to unsettle his ancient instincts, but not enough to rebuild them on a surer basis. In the sublime poem of Lucretius, we see the inevitable battle between the vague dreams of an obsolete mythology and the progressive certainties of physical science. And in the first intensity of the conflict, the iconoclasm extends itself beyond the idols of the old belief to the very bases of belief itself within the soul. The arbitrary laws and tenets of the national creed are found at variance with the discoveries of science. The idea of laws of nature slowly evolves itself in its sublime simplicity and universality, and the idle causes of phenomena which mythology had fabricated in the personal caprices of certain deified abstractions melt away of themselves like shadows in the light of morning. But under all these erroneous figments there lay the primitive instinct of some first cause, the obstinate unconquerable want which no created thing can fill. And this remained untouched amidst the change, as the soul when the body is shattered. But this Lucretius did not understand. He proceeded from the gods of mythology to demolish the very idea of a providence at all. The very truth which he had grasped so firmly that nature obeys certain unvarying laws led him astray, and it was a step reserved for a later time to see that this grand idea is by no means at variance with the ancient instincts of the soul, that the laws of nature, like any other laws, must imply a lawgiver's sanction and authority, and that long before Greek or Roman science, in an unlettered people, whose very name Greece and Rome despised, ancient seers had recognised the scientific principle, and yet at once subordinated it to the highest truth, when they sang of man's impotence to break God's covenant of the day and of the night, that there should not be day and night in their season. Footnote. The word covenant, berith, occurs several times in Scripture to express the laws which God has imposed on nature, and in Jeremiah, chapter 33, verse 25, we have the word ordinances, hukoth, used in the same sense. Compare the prayer book version of Psalm 148, line 6. He hath given them a law which shall not be broken. It is singular that Lucretius uses the word fadis in the same sense, though his atheism deprives the phrase of its real significance. End footnote. Omar Khayyam's scepticism seems to us to belong to a similar phase of mental history with that of Lucretius. He lived in an age and country of religious darkness, and the very men around him, who most felt their wants and misery, had no power to satisfy or remove them. Amidst the religious feeling, which might be at work, acting in various and arbitrary directions, hypocrisy and worldliness widely mingled, and everywhere pressed the unrecognised, but yet overmastering reality, that the national creed was itself not based on the eternal relations of things as fixed by the Creator. The religious fervour, therefore, when it betook itself to its natural channel to flow in, the religion of the people, found nothing to give it sure satisfaction. The internal void remained unfilled. Hence this fervour naturally turned to asceticism and mysticism. The dervishes, fakirs, and Sufis of the Mohammedan world have risen by a law of the human mind. And we think that the scepticism of Omar Khayyam, 
and similar writers is but the result of another similar law the asceticism and mysticism failed in their turn to give solid peace to the inquirer and they were soon overlaid by mummeries and deceits the earnest enthusiasts died and their places were too often filled by impostors and omar khayyam is the result of the inevitable reaction his tetristics are filled with bitter satires of the sensuality and hypocrisy of the pretenders to sanctity but he did not stop there he could see with a clear eye the evil and folly of the charlatans and empirics but he was blind when he turned from these to deny the existence of the soul's disease or at any rate the possibility of a cure here like lucretius he cut himself loose from facts and in both alike we trace the unsatisfied instincts the dim conviction that their wisdom is folly which reflect themselves in darker colours in the misanthropy and despair which cloud their visions of life lucretius when he resolved to follow his material science to the last whithersoever it should lead him built a system for himself in his poem or rather acted as the exponent and interpreter of the greek system which he had embraced his poem on nature has a professed practical aim to explain the world's self-acting machine to the polytheist and to disabuse him of all spiritual ideas omar khayyam builds no system he contents himself with doubts and conjectures he loves to balance antitheses of belief and settle himself in the equipoise of the sceptic epochi fate and free will with all their infinite ramifications and practical consequences the origin of evil the difficulties of evidence the immortality of the soul future retribution all these questions recur again and again not that he throws any new light upon these world-old problems he only puts them in a tangible form condensing all the bitterness in an epigram of this class we subjoin two of the more harmless some of the most daring are better left in their original persian i am not the man to fear annihilation that half forsooth is sweeter than this half which we have this life of mine is entrusted as a loan and when payday comes i will give it back heaven derived no profit from my coming hither and its glory is not increased by my going hence nor hath mine ear ever heard from mortal man this coming and going why they are at all the domar in his impiety was false to his better knowledge we may readily admit while at the same time we may find some excuse for his errors if we remember the state of the world at that time his clear strong sense revolted from the prevailing mysticism where all the earnest spirits of his age found their refuge and his honest independence was equally shocked by the hypocrites who aped their fervour and enthusiasm and at that dark hour of man's history whither out of islam was the thoughtful mohammedan to repair no missionary's step bringing good tidings had appeared on the mountains of persia the few christians who might cross his path in his native land would only seem to him idolaters and even in europe itself christianity lay stifled under an incubus of ignorance and superstition christendom came before omar only in the form of the first crusade these things should be borne in mind as we study mohammedan literature while arabian and persian letters were in their glory europe was buried in medieval darkness science and learning were in their noontide splendor in baghdad and cordova while feudal barbarism brooded over france and england when we read such a life as sadi's with its thirty years of adventure and travel it is strange to mark how entirely the range of his experience is confined to asia and the mohammedan world almost the only one point of contact with christendom is his slavery under the crusaders at tripoli the same isolation runs through all the golden period of persian literature it was already fast fading into tasteless effeminacy when the two shirleys first found their way to the court of abbas the great we now proceed to add a few of the more striking tetristics they will serve as further proofs of what we have remarked on the author's singular position among the poets of his country none that we know of has written fewer lines 
and in none is there so large a proportion of good. The spring cloud came and wept bitterly above the grass. I cannot live without the argivan coloured wine. This grass is our festal place today, but the grass that grows from our dust, whose festal place will it be? Ask not for empire, for life is a moment. Every atom of dust was once a kaikobud or jamshid. The story of the world and this whole life of ours is a dream and a vision, an illusion and a breath. When the nightingale raises his lament in the garden, we must seize, like the tulip, the wine in our hand, ere men, one to the other, in their foolish talk, say, Such an one hath seized his cup and is gone. That castle, in whose hall King Bahram drained the cup, there the fox hath brought forth her young, and the lion made his lair. Bahram, who his life long seized the deer, Gor, see how the tomb, Gor, has seized him to-day. By the running stream and the grass, cup-bearer bright as the lamp, give the wine, break thy vows, and touch the lute. Be glad, for the running stream lifts its voice. I am gone, it cries, and shall never return. Alas that the book of youth is folded, and the fresh purple spring become December, that bird of joy, whose name was youth. Alas, I know not how he came or is gone. Be glad, for the moon of the Eid will be here. All the means of mirth will soon be well. Pale is yon moon, its back bowed and lean. You would say it will soon sink in its sorrow. Lip to lip I passionately kissed the bowl to learn from it the secret of length of days. Lip to lip, in answer, it whispered reply. Drink wine, for once gone, thou shalt never return. I went last night into a potter's shop. A thousand pots did I see there, noisy and silent, when suddenly one of the pots raised a cry, where is the pot-maker, the pot-buyer, the pot-seller? In the view of reality, not of illusion, we mortals are chessmen, and fate is the player. We each act our game on the board of life, and then, one by one, are swept into the box. Yon rolling heavens, at which we gaze bewildered, are but the image of a magic lanthorn. The sun is the candle, the world the shade, and we the images which flit therein. Footnote The Phanos Ikial is explained as a lanthorn, which revolves by the smoke of the candle within, and has on the sides of it figures of various animals. These lanthorns are very common in Calcutta. They are made of a talc cylinder, with figures of men and animals cut out of paper and pasted on it. The cylinder, which is very light, is suspended on an axis round which it easily turns. A hole is cut near the bottom, and the part cut out is fixed at an angle to the cylinder so as to form a vein. When a small lamp or candle is placed inside, a current of air is produced, which keeps the cylinder slowly revolving. End footnote. Last night I dashed my clay cup on the stone, and at the reckless freak my heart was glad when with a voice for the moment out spake the cup i was once as thou and thou shalt be as i we would conclude with two more tetra sticks which may fitly close our imperfect sketch omar khayyam we have said was ill at ease and unhappy his tone of revelry and enjoyment vainly masked the aching void within and where shall we find a more melancholy dirge than the following over a wasted life, with all its knowledge and genius? If coming had been in my power, I would not have come. If going had been in my power, I would not go. O oh, best of all lots, if in this world of clay I had come not, nor gone, nor been at all. And if the present was dark, darker still seemed the future, its darkness made even the present seem bright. Ere death raises his night attack on thy head, bid them bring the rose-red wine. No gold art thou, poor brain-sick fool, that, once buried, they should dig thee out again. 
How different from the feeling of good old Isaac Walton, when he stood by the open grave of his friend, Dr. Dunn, and thought of that body which once was a temple of the Holy Ghost, and is now become a small quantity of Christian dust. But I shall see it reanimated. End of section. Section 3 of A Second Rubaiyat Miscellany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Some more of Omar's Quatrains by Whitley Stokes. 1. Death. I dashed my clay cup on the stone hard by. The reckless frolic raised my heart on high. Then said a shard with momentary voice, As thou have I been, thou shalt be as I. Annihilation makes me not to fear. In truth it seems more sweet than lingering here. My life was sent me as a loan unsought. When payday comes, I'll pay without a tear. Has God made profit from my coming? Nay, his glory gains not when I go away. Mine ear has never heard from mortal man this coming and this going. Why are they? I'd not have come had this been left to me, nor would I go to go if I were free. Oh, best of all, upon this lonely earth neither to come nor go. Yes, not to be. Oh, that there were some place where men could rest, some end to look for in this lonely quest, some hope that in a hundred thousand years our dust might blossom on the mother's breast. Alas for me, the book of youth is read. The fresh glad spring is now December dead. That bird of joy, whose name was youth, is flown. I me. I know not how he came or fled. 2. God Thou art the opener, open thou the door. Thou art the teacher, teach my soul to soar. No human masters hold me by the hand. They pass away, thou abidest evermore. I cannot reach the road to join with thee. I cannot bear one breath apart from thee. I dare not tell this grief to any man. Ah, hard! Ah, strange! Ah, longing sweet for thee! 3. Conduct In school and cloister, mosque and fane, one lies a dread of hell, or dreams of paradise. But none that know the secrets of the Lord have sown their hearts with such like fantasy. Ah, strive amain, no human heart to wring, Let no one feel thine anger burn or sting. Wouldst thou be lapped in long-enduring joy? Know how to suffer, cause no suffering. While sinew, vein and bone together blend, Outside the path of doom we cannot wend. Bow not thy neck, though Rustum be thy foe, Be bound to none, though Hutim be thy friend. 4. Consolation This is the time for roses and repose beside the stream that by the meadow goes, a friend or two, a sweetheart like a rose, with wine, and none to heed her muller's prose. Come, bring that ruby in yon crystal bowl, that brother true of every open soul. Thou knowest over well this life of ours is wind that hurries by. Oh, bring the bowl. With loving lip to lip the bowl I drain, To learn how long my soul must here remain, And lip to lip it whispers, While you live, drink, For, once gone, you come not back again. Sweet airs are blowing on the rose of May, Sweet eyes are shining down the garden gay, Aught yet of dead yestreen you cannot say, No more of it, so sweet is this to-day. When death uproots my life-plant, ear and grain, And flings them forth to moulder on the plain, If men shall make a wine-jug of my clay, And brim with wine, twill leap to life again. This jar was once a lover like to me, Lost in the light of wooing one like thee. 
and lo the handle here upon the neck was once the arm that held her neck in fee your love lets hold my hair forsaken head therefore my lips in warning wine are red repentance born of reason you have wrecked and time has torn the robe that patience made end of section Section 4 of A Second Rubiat Miscellany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Uma of Nishapur by Charles J. Pickering. Reprinted from the National Review, December 1890. Part 1. Of the comparatively few Oriental writers who have become well known in Europe, Al Khayyam has perhaps been the least fortunate ignored by Derbelot, misrepresented and maligned by von Hammer, and made the mouthpiece of a purely modern pessimism by his most successful translator, the shade of the old Hakim, were it not long ago well lulled to sleep beneath the ancestral roses, might justly have risen in reproach of a misbelieving and unsympathetic generation, which deems itself wiser than the children of the dawn. The brilliant paraphrase of Edward Fitzgerald has made the name of Umar somewhat of a household word. As an English poem, it is so nearly faultless that, for those to whom its haunting music has been a companion of years, to balance calmly its merits and defects would be no easy task. But when we compare it with the original, we are surprised to find how much of the English version is original too. And this is not all of the indictment. It traduttori, traditori runs the Italian proverb, and rarely could it find an apter illustration than the case in point. Among a considerable section of his Oriental readers, as in the parallel case of Hafez, and, since von Hummer's time, in Europe generally, Umar has had to bear the character of a poetic black sheep. Following in the track of the author of the Geschichte der schönen Redekunst der Persiens, the translator, while investing his subject with a beauty of rhythm and phrase that reminds us rather of the laureate than of any eastern songster, throws the sceptical side of Umar's genius into still darker shadow, so that the vacillating doubt and despondency of the Persian grow, in his hands, a paean of passionate denial and defiance. It would, however, be unfair to contend that for this there is positively no warrant in the original lawless and uncertain thoughts occur but they seem rather to be thrown out at random stray sparks from the furnace of a fiery spirit ill at ease with itself than parts of a deliberate system of hynesque mockery or of byronic scorn phrases scattered here and there throughout the rubaiyat are given an emphasis and used in a sequence their author would probably have been the first to disown indeed at the outset it would have been better Pace, the Calcutta reviewer, to whom we owe a debt of gratitude for his delightful biographical sketch, to have taken Umar as a mind of the Horatian rather than of the Lucretian order, for system, of all things, is what is least conspicuous in the kaleidoscopic pages of the Rubaiyat. Well does Mr. Winfield, his English editor, say, with reference to the philosophic kinship of the poet, the parallel often sought to be traced between him and Lucretius has no existence. Whatever he was, he was not an atheist. To him, as to other Mohammedans of his time, to deny the existence of the deity would seem to be tantamount to denying the existence of the world and of himself. It must be borne in mind that al Khayyam, if the bulk of what has come down to us as his be genuine, is a man of many moods that he had been initiated into all the mysteries of Tazawuf can hardly be questioned. Even Mr. Fitzgerald, who rejects the Sufism of Hafez and a fortiori, that of Umar, admits some traditional presumption in favour of this view, and that his powerful and original intellect sometimes led him to the threshold of a broader truth, faith in which had risen on the basis of an honest doubt, which feebler minds so little understood, seems no less certain. Footnote. 
The words of a powerful, though obscure English poet of the 17th century are here peculiarly applicable. In both temperament and experience, there was much in common between the two men. Though truth and falsehood be near twins, yet truth a little elder is. Be busy to seek her, believe me this. He's not of none, nor worst, that seeks the best. To adore, or scorn an image, or protest, may all be bad. Doubt wisely, in strange way to stand inquiring right, is not to stray. Done. Third Satire End footnote Few of his successors ever rose so high. The lighter or looser rhymes, amid which these passages occur, like sparks among the stubble, and whose proximity is due to that odd eastern fashion which ranges poems according to the alphabetic sequence of their terminal letters, only serve to heighten by contrast the effect of these loftier utterances, which, if gathered together, would yield quite a new conception of Umar's character and genius. Footnote. In La Quatrains de Quiam, Paris, 1867, Monsieur Nicolas has collected upwards of 460 rubaiyat, or rather has republished that collection lithographed in Tehran some years before. It is, however, only fair to state that Mr. Fitzgerald based his version on the very small recu in the Bodleian, manuscript Usley, 140, containing several quatrains not found in the editions of the Imperial Dragoman, which seems to have appeared just too late to be of any practical use to the English poet. The Oxford Codex, which, scanty as it is, must be admitted to be one of the oldest redactions, it was transcribed in 1461, is well represented in Mr. E. H. Winfield's scholarly edition of the Rubaiyat, Krubner, 1883, to which the reader is referred for bibliographical and biographical particulars. End footnote. In the Tariq ul Hakuma, a philosophical compendium of great value, whose original author, Jamal Uddin Ali, died not much more than a century after Umar, we find an interesting notice of him, which, though written from an unfriendly point of view, supports our contention that Al Qayyam's temper was not purely Pyrrhonic if indeed it was Pyrrhonic at all. Umar al-Qayyam, Imam of Khurasan, and the profoundest savant of his time, was learned in the science of the Greeks, Yunan. He was ever urging the quest of the one only judge by means of the purification of bodily motions and the sublimation of the human soul, and he enjoined the zealous study of political science according to the principles of the Greek philosophic school. The moderns of the Sufi sect have adopted and adapted to their own system the exoteric sense of part of his makings, and bring it up for discussion in their assemblies and private gatherings. But their esoteric sense consists in axioms of comparative religion, sharia atu luazi, and maxims of universal obligation. But since the people of his day reviled him for his belief, and exposed to view the secrets he had veiled from them, he feared for his blood, and reigned in the bridle of his tongue and pen. He made the pilgrimage, not from piety, but as a result of a chance rencontre, wherein also he betrayed the secrets of his heart's ungodliness. When he got to Baghdad, the men of his own method, in ancient science, beset him, but he shut on them the door with the shutting of compunction and not of companionship. Sadda ndimi la sadda ndimi and he returned from the Hajj unto his city, to repair morning and evening to the place of worship, concealing his secret thoughts, yet they could not but out. He was unparalleled in astronomy and natural philosophy, Hikmat, and his preeminence in these provinces would have passed into a proverb, had he only safeguarded his good name, Laurazaku la smata. By him there are fugitive verses, whose secret sense pierces their veil of concealment, and whose fount of conception is troubled by the turbidness of their hidden intent. Since my soul is content with an easy enough, so that little sans toil palm nor arm may procure, from the turns and reversions of time it is safe. Guard me, hand and heart's aim, in my life's darkest hour. 
in the dizzying whirl hath the heavens not decreed that all fortunate stars to disaster should lower then patience o soul in thy noonday repose build the base in too close thou all topplest the tower it is a remarkable fact that nearly all that is best in the history and literature of persia has come from Khorasan, that highland region whose mountains often rise to an elevation of twelve or thirteen thousand feet seems to have been peculiarly fitted to foster a strain of hardy intellectual growth which grafted on the product of the rich soil of historic iran was to blossom in strange and beautiful fertility the banu barmak the premier clan of the old gubra aristocracy of persia extirpated at one fell swoop by the relentless suspicion of the most fortunate of the caliphs originated in Khorasan. the alus saman the nursing fathers of persian letters traced their ancestry to a like source and it was at the brilliant court of abu nasir the lord of Khorasan and transoxiana that the genius of master rudaji the proto-poet of modern iran was cultivated to an almost phenomenal activity by showers of unstinted gold and here it was that persia's loftiest and most human singer the immortal firdausi was born umar therefore from his cradle could not but have been breathing a poetic air and his love for his native land is testified by the heimweh which led him in the full sunshine of imperial favour and at the apex of his scientific fame to seek retirement for the rest of his days at Nishapur. One need not linger over the circumstances of Umar's career, which are sufficiently well known. Born about the end of the 11th century's third decade, in a township of Nishapur, at the imperial Madrash of that city, he not only received from the Imam Muwafiq, a time-white father, of eighty or ninety summers, the solid foundations of a knowledge of the best science of the time, but made in the person of abul Qazim, better known as nizam ul mulk the future chancellor of three sultans and the most enlightened administrator of medieval asia a friendship which was to have a signal effect upon his own fortunes and was only to be severed by death it was the nizam's first action when he had attained the supreme power in the state under alp ashlan the saluk to offer office to his old schoolfellow but Umar, like the true sage, Hakim, that he was, requested nothing but a modest pension that would suffer him to be true to himself. The generous friend made over to him the revenue of his native place, and Umar spent the remainder of his peaceful days at Nishapur, busy in winning knowledge of every kind, and especially in astronomy, says Nazum ul Mulk himself. One journey of his is recorded when in the splendid reign of Malik Shah he visited Mar, and the Sultan lavished praises and honours on his famous geometer, whose labours had effected that rectification of the calendar and which still holds good in the Mohammedan East, and according to Gibbon, or rather Hyde, approaches the correctness of the Gregorian style. Footnote. An algebraic tract, edited by M. Werpke, Paris, 1851, is the only extant scientific production of Umar's. His work seems to have been silently absorbed in that of later mathematicians. End footnote. The snatches of song which have immortalised his name seem to have been his relaxation from the strain of professional toil. In this he offers a striking resemblance to two of the greatest poets of Europe, Dante and Goethe, to whom the pursuit of knowledge was the business of life, and to sing of it, their recreation. A passionate devotion to natural science is characteristic of all three, and in each we see a yearning love of human sympathy and a power of pure and lofty friendship which reminds us of the antique world. But from all accounts it seems, as indeed one might gather from his verses, that Umar's devotion even to science was not that of an anchorite. Persian chroniclers tell us, says Monsieur Nicolas, that Khayyam was much given to converse and quaff with his friends in moonlit evenings on the terrace of his house, he seated upon a carpet surrounded by singers and musicians, with a saki who, cup in hand, offered the wine to all the joyous company in turn, an usage which, 
with the substitution of the crystal decanter for the terracotta cruise and the wine glass for the cup of copper still holds in persia at the present day we must remember says a thoughtful writer in fraser for may eighteen seventy nine footnote mrs h m cadell who was the first in england to draw attention to the true omar khayyam End footnote. that drinking had in the east at that time no vulgar associations wine parties were common in the houses of the great men and in the courts of the princes these wine parties were in fact the nurseries of all the intellectual life of the time which was unconnected with religion and did much to counteract the dullness of orthodox mohammedan life footnote in the zadur musafir a medical treatise written in the latter half of the tenth century by a physician of Kaiwan, abu jafar by name he is ranked with avicenna averroes and rhazes Etude sur le sard de Moncretier, par Monsieur Gustave Dongat, Journal Asiatique, Volume 3, 1854. We find a curious corroboration of the view just set forth. The best means of banishing a tendency to melancholy, and keeping it from enrooting itself in the mind, is to drink wine with melody, to be merry with one's friends, to occupy oneself with making and reciting verses and to contemplate running water, gardens, verdure, and sweet fresh faces. Galen saith that whoso matureth the first must of the grape, so that it rejoiceth the sorrowing spirit, and reneweth gladness, is a man of healing wisdom. And the learned African goes into much detail concerning the virtues of wine and of music, which are like a body and a soul, and their combined action as a curative treatment is best seen, he says, when quaffing, one seeth, seated round him, agreeable figures whose shape the Creator hath perfected and finished their graces, and on whom the soul's light coruscates in brilliance and beauty, and this, if possible, should be in the midst of fresh gardens and lawny parterres, or, at least, in halls carpeted with rose-leaves and willow and myrtle and sweet basil, which maketh the sad heart to rejoice. With all this, he adds, let one beware of excess. End footnote. It has been suggested by von Hummer that Umar's flings at philosophy were stimulated by envy at the fame and fortune of Amir Muizi, who had risen from the position of Sipahi, Sepoy, or common soldier, to be the Dichterkönig, or laureate of Malik Shah, and ever in his favour as the historian informs us. This singer was a Sufi mystic of undoubted sincerity, and so far as can be seen from the specimens given by von Hammer, held opinions not widely differing from those of Umar himself. One very characteristic ghazal chants a lofty pantheism in terms well nigh identical with Umar's own. It might be, indeed, that at moments when the doubting, questioning spirit had set in, the Khorasani took expressions of his famous contemporary in vain. And, of course, it is not impossible that some personal rivalry between the two poets may have existed, although such a feeling was alien to the self-contained and independent character of the author of the Rubaiyat. After all, Khayyam's mockery is more at the expense of self than of others, and his satire is evidently reserved for the pretenders to divine knowledge. For example, in the last quatrain, he says, They, who an ocean are of virtues and of wit, by whose consummate glory are all their fellows lit, out of this obscure slumber find us not a way, tell us an old wife's tale, and fall asleep in it. Elsewhere he brings out more clearly the cause of his dissatisfaction. Those who the whole world's quintessential spirit appear, who wing their contemplation past the crowning sphere, for all they know of thee are like the heavens themselves, dizzied and in amaze they bow the head in fear. He shadows forth the remedy in another passage, where also man, as the microcosm, is termed the quintessence, kalasar, of the world, and which may help us as a clue to the meaning of many of his ambiguous utterances about wine. O thou who art the cosmos' quintessential strain, for a brief breath 
let be the worry of loss and gain take but one cup from the eternal saki take and go for ever free from the two worlds grief and pain the thought that one draught of the mystic wine the love potion of the eternal induces oblivion alike of natural and supernatural hope and fear is elsewhere expressed under a different symbolism in convent and in college synagogue and church of hell they live in fear for paradise they search but whoso once hath known the mysteries of god will never let such weeds his soul's fair field besmirch and in another quatrain the quietest doctrine is enunciated with a still greater boldness each heart wherein he needs the leavening light of love whether a haunter of mosque or synagogue he prove in the great book of love if he his name hath writ is free from hell and free from paradise above footnote jeremy taylor in his sermon on the mercy of the divine judgments cites the story of st ivo going in an embassy to st louis and meeting by the way a grave sad woman with fire in one hand and water in the other who asks what these symbols may mean makes answer my purpose is with fire to burn paradise and with my water to quench the flames of hell that men may serve god without the incentives of hope and fear and purely for the love of god vaughan's hours with the mystics volume two page two hundred and one end footnote this conclusion reminds us of the beautiful legend of abu bin adam so gracefully and tenderly versified by lee hunt write me as one that loves his fellow men but that umar's love is rather the divine affection which rounds all human brotherhood and charity in its perfect orb the formalism of current orthodoxy seems to have exercised the mind of umar in no little degree and accounts for much of his apparent irreverence he frequently takes up his parable against the pharisees and hypocrites of his day and their practice of making long prayers arouses his especial dislike to him the humble hope that trusts and is not afraid is a truer adoration than that which clothes itself in the garb of liturgical forms they are gone the travellers and ne'er a one returns to tell of aught beyond the mystic veil that burns thy work were better done by esperance than prayer for without truth and hope no prayer a prophet earns the above reads like the recantation of an utterance closing in the same rhyme cadence of which it is the perfect antithesis of all the travellers who tread the long long way as one returned for me to ask him news i pray take care lest thou within this little inn of life leave aught on the score of hope thou'lt not review the day in reading the rubaiyat we seem to be spectators of a life drama a master spirit's progress and development through the clash and conflict of the eternal nay and yea not less so though less fully expressed than that of carlyle in sartor shakespeare in the sonnets or tennyson in in memoriam when we begin to trace our way through the sad jumble of thought produced by the alphabetical arrangement of the quatrains no two of which were probably more consecutive than a pair of greek epigrams we cannot but be conscious of three dominant moods of mind if not periods of mental development epicurean sceptical mystic infinite and well-nigh imperceptible are the gradations whereby the exhortation to mere physical enjoyment the joyous and thoughtless spirit of youth pass over into the bitter or sorrowful questioning of a soul without god or hope in the world and these again through the self-abasement of conscious sin into the calm and deliberate utterance of trust or the half enigmatical rapture of one who sees behind the veil and as every great spirit exists no less as the child of his own age than for all time so we may consider umar's earlier compositions to have been influenced if not inspired by the prevailing fashion of the time with its princely symposiums and feasts of reason and not a little by the graceful wine songs of avicenna died ten thirty seven in whom also science blossomed into poetry as in his later days 
grown wiser by the discipline of intellectual defeat, he became more and more in harmony with that profounder cast of thought and feeling which found, a few years later, so grand an exponent in Jalauddin of Ikomium and an interpreter to the world in Sadi of Shiraz. It is the remark of von Hummer that a sceptical era is followed no less in nations than in individuals by a period of mystic devotion and the religious revival which is its external token and garb. We need not, therefore, be discouraged by the strange ambiguity of many of Umar's utterances, where it seems equally difficult to accept the literal or parabolic sense. That a poet may, at one period of his life, use a phrase in the ordinary acceptation, which, in a later development of thought, he may employ as a symbol of higher things, is not without a notable example, in the case of Dante, whose human, if not sensuous passion, sublimated by the fire of bereavement and sorrow, is ultimately refined into a high rapture of mystic adoration, whose terms are yet the same, though in their later tenor, like kindred sounds in Spencer's enchanted forest, or the dream world of Blake, more is meant than meets the ear. End of part one. End of section. Section five of a second Rubaiyat Miscellany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Umar of Nishapur by Charles J. Pickering. Part two. Umar's wine epigram is sometimes so dark a saying that for lack of an interpreter we are fain to leave it in its own melodious obscurity, not without a shrewd suspicion that he, like other powerful minds, is occasionally apt to take pleasure in mystifying his hearers and to send forth his poetic shafts for nunta sintoisen, without very much care as to where and who the understanding may be. His friends would hold the key, and that was enough for him. There is a strange and terribly audacious play of fancy about the following, which may or may not be figurative. When I am dead, my friends, wash me with vintage rare, wine and a goblet o'er me invoke in lieu of prayer. On resurrection day, if ye would seek my lair, look for me neath the dust our wine-house portals bear. Elsewhere he recurs to the same thought. O my beloved companions, hearten me with wine, and make ye ruby red this ambered face of mine. Wash ye with wine my corpse when I am cold and dead, and make my coffin wood of timber of the vine. By comparison with the following, we get a little light. The Quran, which men use to call the word sublime, not constantly they read, only from time to time. But on the beaker's brim is written a verse of light, which men for evermore may read in every clime. According to the exoteric Zahiri sense, this, of course, means merely that potation is better than devotion. But, as the Tehran Sufi pointed out to Nicola, there is another, and an esoteric, Batini, which interprets the wine cup as the world of phenomena, brimming with the love of God, and the inscription on the lip, the apocalypse of himself in creation, which, unlike the scrolls of mortal prophets, is ever open to those under whose eyes it is given to see. In another place, he gives to the thought, if we may interpret it in the above sense, a still more mystical expression. Drink thou of this, it is the wine of life etern. Drink, tis the reservoir whence joys of youth ye earn. Tis burning like the fire, yet lighteneth our face even like the water of life. Drink deeply from the urn. To this passage there is rather a remarkable parallel in the Jewish Christian apocryphal book of Esdras, Second Esdras, chapter 14, verses 39 and 40. The prophet, watching under the oak tree for his revelation, has a vision of the Lord. Behold, he reached me a full cup, which was full, as it were, with water, but the colour of it was like fire, and I took it and drank, and when I had drunk of it my heart uttered understanding, and wisdom grew in my breast. But whatever we may think of the foregoing, there is surely little that is enigmatical about the following. 
on the world's coquetry fools lavish not your coin when all her ways and windings know ye line by line give not unto the wind this precious life your own but hasten seek the friend and quickly quaff the wine footnote we are reminded of the dying words of nizam ul mulk o oh god i am passing away in the hand of the wind End footnote. the prevailing thought however of those which we would consider as the earlier quatrains is the brevity of life and the horatian maxim carpe diem it is on these as indeed we might expect in a youthful poet that umar has chiefly expended the wealth of his fancy a few may be adduced as fair samples of the rest wake for the morning breaks and rends the robe of night why sorrowful rise and quaff the draught of dawn aright drain thou the wine sweetheart for many a morn shall break and turn her eyes to ours and ours be lorn of light the yesterday that's gone endeavour to forget and mourn not for to-morrow tis not risen yet root not thy hope in aught of things that come and go be happy now and fling not life to the winds to fret a wise man unto me came in my sleep and said from whose sleep ever bloomed the rose of gladness red why wilt thou do a thing that so the twin of death drink for full soon thou'lt sleep with dust above thy head see how the wind of dawn has rent the rose's robe how bulbul by her beauty is filled with joy and love sit in the rose's shade for many a bloom like this has out of the dust arisen and lain with dust above since no one can become a surety for the morrow rejoice thee now and clear thy heart of carking sorrow drink wine in the light of wine for the moon my moon shall look for us no more how oft the heaven she circle through tis a sweet day the breeze is neither hot nor cold soft clouds have laid the dust from every rose's fold and to the yellow rose in speech like ours implores the nightingale one draught and lose thy hue of gold be of good cheer for chagrin will be infinite upon the sphere of heaven stars shall conjoin and smite the potter's clay that from thy body need shall be will build the palace walls where others see the light khayyam times very self's ashamed of any one who in the day of sorrow sits faint-hearted down wine do thou quaff in crystal to the lute's lament or ere thy crystal bowl be shattered on the stone lay in my palm the wine my heart's on fire to-day and fleet foot as quicksilver this life will not stay wake for the smile of fortune is but as a dream wake for the fire of youth like water flows away what time her roving purple on her the violet throws and morning breezes ruffle petal folds of rose wiser were he who by his silver-breasted love quaffs of the wine and shatters goblet ere he goes occasionally as in his roman prototype we catch amid this forced gaiety a tone of deeper pathos twere best we o'er the wine-cup gave our hearts to glee and take light thought of aught that's gone or come to be and this our soul that's lent us prisoner as it is one moment from the bonds of intellect set free ah that the scroll of youth so soon should be uprolled and pleasure's springtide freshness wrinkle so and fold that bird of joy whereon is set the name of youth knows neither how it came nor whither its course must hold where never a labour of ours has issue to our heart wherefore should we take thought where to our impulse start so sit we down in sorrow and sigh in our regret too late too late we came too soon must we depart in this wild whirl of time that breeds the base alone uncounted griefs and pangs bear i till life be done my heart a rosebud shut i the rosier of the world a blood-red tulip flower in time's plantation grown his longing for the sympathy of a kindred spirit a maham i raz a confidant of soul secrets 
which is characteristic of all true poets, the nec recito cui cum nisi amicis of Horace, in a deeper sense, finds expression again in the following. Falcon-like, in the world of mystery have I flown, in hope to leave this low and reach a loftier zone. But for I find not here a soul for confidence, I from that door whereby I came again am gone. In spite of its distinctly Sufi flavour, this quatrain can surely be read in a merely human sense. He has felt for, but not yet found, the eternal friend, and in his loneliness he yearns for a brother man with whom to share his perplexities. As with Shakespeare, in his middle period, that of Timon and of Troilus, there seems to have come a time in Umar's history when the beauty of life was as apples of Sodom, the bitterness of self-reproach a very mara to his soul, a time when he could not sing as in the thoughtless days, plant not within thy soul the shoot of sorrow's tree, the manuscript of joy read unremittingly, for the newly awakened conscience will not be lulled, and gives him no rest. When the thought of my faults presents itself before me, he says, my face flows down with tears that are born of my heart of fire. At this wild whirl of heaven I sorrow evermore, and with my own base nature ever am at war. Science avails me not to rise above the world, nor reason lets me rest where no earth noises roar. To the reproaches of those who do not understand him and accuse him of moral cowardice, he replies, and the humility of his answer is reflected in his style. Deem not it is the world whereat I am dismayed, or death and soul's departure frighten with their shade. For that it is a fact, of death have I no fear, tis that I live not well, whereof I am afraid. In the turmoil of self-accusation and self-excuse, he seeks for comfort in the doctrine of determinism which he had imbibed from childhood, and gives it a characteristic turn. That day the steed of heaven was saddled for the race, Pawan and Mushtari sprang forth in all their grace, in the divan of fate was my lot cast also. How then should sin be mine, with destiny in the chase? In his perplexity he is almost ready to reproach the first cause, Thou before whom the maze of sin is clear to see, to him hath ears to hear declare this mystery. For knowledge absolute of sin's cause to conceive, in a wise man's eyes the extreme of ignorance would be. It seems to him that if the nature of sin, its causal power, had been present to the infinite consciousness, it would never in the scheme of creation have been suffered to be. An anticipation, we might almost say, of that philosophy of the unconscious which has proceeded from the school of Schopenhauer. Footnote. This theory of the unconsciousness of the first cause is taught by Plotinus, and seems to have been held by Clement of Alexandria, whose logos is the consciousness of the Father. Big, the Christian Platonists, 1886, pages 10 and 54. End footnote. Wearied with beating his wings against the bars of this insoluble problem, he falls back upon a pathetic remonstrance and lament. Of clay and water hast thou needed me, what can I? Hast woven me of silk and wool to be, what can I? And every deed I give to life, be it good or ill, was written on my soul by thy decree, what can I? al Khayyam's final appeal for remission if we may so regard it, is not without an added interest for us as having been the subject of one of the most daring inversions in literature. The following is a bald reproduction of Umar's words as they stand in the Tehran text. O knower of the secrets of the heart of every man, who in the hour of weakness bears the part of every man, accept, O Lord, my penitence, and me forgiveness give, thou who forgiver and excuser art of every man. This quatrain, as Mrs. Cadell was the first to point out, is the sole known warrant for that startling passage in Mr. Fitzgerald's poem which has so largely affected our conception of Umar. O thou, who man of baser earth didst make, and e'en with paradise devised the snake, for all the sin wherewith the face of man is blackened, man's forgiveness give and take. 
Kayam was bold enough at times, remarks the critic, but we do not think he reached the point of offering God forgiveness for man's sins. The allusions in the second and third lines do not seem to be traceable in any extant text of the Rubaiyat. Let us now examine a few Rubaiyat of the strictly mystical class, that which we would consider characteristic of his later and graver years. But, between these and the rest, there is no hard and fast line to be drawn. There is no sudden conversion, but a gradually growing conviction of eternal realities, not objectively merely, but as existent in the self, the individual consciousness. This reunion of finite with infinite, the maksad i aksa, or the uttermost aim of Sufi devotion, is beautifully figured by Jalal in one of his ghazals, as translated most worthily by Mr. Gibb, in appendix to the book of Sindibad, edited by W. A. Clouston, Glasgow, 1884, page 270. If to travel thou canst not avail, then journey to thine own heart, and e'en as the ruby mine, be fired by the ray serene. O master, journey thou forth, away from thyself to thyself, for the ore of the mine turns gold by a journey like this, I ween. From sourness and bitterness here, to the region of sweetness fair, for that every moon from the light of the sun is with grace beseen. In his own quaint manner, Al-Kayam gives the thought expression. While on the path of hope, let no heart pass unknown, while on the path of presence, make a friend your own. A hundred clay and water kabas are not worth one heart, whereafter seek, and kabas leave alone. Footnote. Niyaz, hope or aspiration, and hazur, presence, the beatific vision, are respectively the second and penultimate stages of the tadik, or way of perfection, of which the fourth and last is hakikat, truth equals God, absolute absorption into the divine essence or nirvana. End footnote. As he rises in the scale of insight, his sympathies widen, and he can perceive that to the true believer no faith is alien, and that variations and discrepancies of worship, be it sincere, are less of kind than of degree, the fairest feature of the mystic school in every age. Hinduism, which he typifies by the name Pagoda, Utkada, or Idol House, and which was, in his time, the object of unceasing crusades on the part of Islam, is more than once brought by him into honourable prominence, and is made, equally with Zoroastrianism and with Christianity, the vehicle of his wider hope. Pagoda, Kaaba, both are temples of true service. The bell peal is the hymning music of true service. The mihrab and the church, the rosary and cross, in truth are one, and all but tokens of true service. Elsewhere, by a play upon words not unknown to the Hebrew Scriptures, he opposes to the everlasting light, Nur, of Islam, the eternal fire, Nar, of Mazdaism. Not surely, as Nicola would have us suppose, the fire of hell, unless, indeed, there being a lurking double entendre, mischievously contrived for those profane ones who could or would not distinguish the one from the other, a view quite in keeping with what we know of Umar's character. Though our lot be not the roses, yet we have the thorn, and there's a fire, although for us no light be born, and there's the belfry chime and church and Brahma thread, although no kunkah shelter or darvish dress be worn. This feeling is expressed as boldly in the Rubai, where he says that the worshipper, whether he be Jew or Muslim, if only his name is written in God's great book of love, all Garthios Agapi Esti, is freed alike from the gross pains and the grosser pleasures of the popular hell and paradise, a sentiment strangely in opposition to the recorded injunction of Muhammad, spare not the synagogue of Satan. That spiritual liberty, whose correlative in the moral sphere is the autarchia of Epictetus, and Antonine is the object of his earnest longing, if haply he may find it. The heart that isolation's fullness doth not own is helpless, daily mate of her own penitent moan. 
how shall true joy be hers except the soul is free all else whate'er it be is root of grief alone like sir henry wotton he can picture to himself the blissful state of the man who is lord of himself though not of lands and having nothing yet hath all indeed his conception has as much a christian as a stoic flavour and recalls the sermon on the mount as well as the meditations happy the heart of him who passes life unknown who never wore cashmere or lawn or lamb's wool gown who like the simurgh wings his flight in highest heaven who makes not like the owl mid ruined worlds his moan in this world whoso hath but half a loaf of bread and in his breast a refuge where to lay his head who of no man is slave who of no man is lord tell such to live in joy his world is sweet indeed all these currents of thought meet and mingle in one harmonious outburst of devotion which is vigorously expressed in umar's truest style in faith are two and seventy worships great and small but the worship of thy love will i choose before them all what's unbelief belief obedience or sin before thee the one aim let all pretences fall here in common with the mystics of every school he seeks to solve the riddle of evil by questioning its existence in fact or by assuming it to be merely relative a shadow which rightly seen is swallowed up in the fullness of the infinite light and to this conclusion he must have been helped not a little by the deterministic theology which he had learned from the imam muafik and to which he gives as to every phase of his thought a characteristic expression limbed on creation's tablet each and all exists yet evermore from good or ill the pencil rests all that is destined must in justice come to be and vain the wish that yearns the sorrow that resists from the belief that good and evil in our sense of the words are banished from the councils of eternity to a denial to moral distinctions of anything but a relative existence was but a step this most dangerous doctrine so capable of the corruptio optimi pessima is touched upon by jami the last of the great sufi poets in a proem to his exquisite allegory salaman and absal as a prayer that the beatific vision may annihilate his self-identity and release him from the distinction between good and evil may make him as mr fitzgerald well expresses it in his fine paraphrase self-lost and conscience quit of good and evil sometimes umar's rapture of contemplation carries him very high and his tone though not his style reminds us now of shelley and now of emerson take for example the following thou whom the whole world seeks in frenzy and fire of mind barren alike before thee are rich and poor mankind thou art mingled in all speech and every ear is deaf thou art present to all men and every eye is blind some time to mortal man thou show'st thy hidden face some time art manifest in cosmic form and trace and this magnificence show'st thou to thine own self for thou art the eyes that see the vision they embrace the drop to the seas lamenting separate are we rather tis thou and i are all things laughs the sea truly there is none other we are god alone tis but a tittle's varying sunders thee and me we should be doing injustice to umar's genius were we to omit from our view that aspect of it which is so characteristic of the man and singles him out from all his fellows that grotesque humour so rare in eastern literature which is the one point he possesses in common with heine and which we may almost say is the antiseptic salt that has preserved his thought fresh for us after the lapse of centuries this spirit of self-banter which plays lightly around so many of his utterances is not quite absent from even such a topic as the assurance of his own immortality to which it gives the quaintest of turns yet here he is evidently in earnest the moment when i shall from death escape and flee and shed like leaf from bough my body from life's tree 
with what glad heart i'll make the universe a sieve or ere an earthly riddle sift the dust of me the same spirit is noticeable in one of his potatory quatrains of which it were difficult to say whether he is merely jesting or is propounding a sufic sentiment under a bizarre form like some passages already quoted it is of so enigmatical a character as to fairly baffle our scrutiny when Asia dawn begins to lift her light divine look in thine hand there be the wine bowl flashing fine they say that truth is ever bitter in the mouth and by that argument the truth must needs be wine in the same category we might include a quatrain in which Khayyam, after his own peculiar fashion, reproaches fortune's wheel. Ah, wheel of heaven, no guest but fears thy perfidy. Naked thou keep'st me stripped as fish that's in the sea. While all creation's clad by spinning wheels of earth, there's ne'er a spinning wheel that far surpasseth thee. We have seen how Umar speaks of Christianity. Let us see how a Mohammedan may speak of its founder. Even though it be not genuine, the rubai was assuredly written by a Muslim. The mode adopted is that of self-remonstrance. Fool, for thy fear of death and boding of surcease, when from extinction springs a life of endless bliss, soon as in Issa's breath I grow a living soul, eternal death shall leave my little life in peace. The quickening breath of Jesus is frequently made a poetic figure by the Persians, and sometimes, as in the Masibat Nama of Attar, the effect of its miraculous exertion is described. But nowhere, so far as we are aware, is the spiritual significance so beautifully brought out as in the above. Footnotes 1. To convince a sinner, Mariam's son makes earth rosy with the blood of a gazelle, broils and partakes of it then gathering the bones breathes into them new life the fawn snatched from that breath's impress worshipped and sprang into the wilderness footnote two hafez after his fashion makes isa lead the celestial dance with zura venus the spirit of the evening star end of footnotes we must however bear in mind that by the persian jesus was regarded less as the penultimate prophet of Islam than as the supreme Sufi, that master mystic who had attained absolute identity with deity, and who was, to all who followed in the same path of contemplation and purity, at once a teacher and a type. There is yet one aspect more of Umar's mind in which we have not contemplated him, and this is a very amiable one. With it, let us take our leave of him, laying at his feet our feeble tribute of admiration and sympathy, in the hope that the circle of his true friends and faithful interpreters may widen, and that, in his own words, he may bind many a heart to him hereafter in the cords of love. Though the world's face thou make all populous to be, tis far less than to bring one sorrowing heart in glee. If thou, by graciousness, but make one freeman bend, tis better than to set a thousand bondmen free. End of Umar of Nishapur by Charles J. Pickering End of section